Awesome. Well, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21 as we begin our time together. If we have not been introduced, my name is Nate, one of the pastors here, and it is my privilege and honor to bring the word today, this morning. We're continuing on in a series we've been calling Viral Church. It's been quite a few months since we've been in this series, looking out the expansive, explosive, exponential growth of the early church. I don't know about you, but it's been encouraging to me to think about the early church movement and how what began as just a couple dozen believers blew up into what we have today, millions upon millions of those following Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we're looking forward to today's um, title, today's message is uh, Knock Knock. Knock, knock. And if you want to find some study notes, we have our own Anthem Chapel app on the App Store or on the other stores in the Android, whatever those things are called. And uh, go there, download it, and you can go to a little uh, couple, you can find my study notes on there. And if you fill those bad boys out and see me after the service, you will receive a prize. That's right. There's a prize for paying attention. I do not mind bribing you. We believe that God's given us a vision from the very beginning, to proclaim the name of Jesus, that all would look to him, they'd be looking toward him to be saved. And our desire is to create a church community that's learning how to love and live just like Jesus. That's what we're all about. That's why these past 14 days, another seven days ago, we've been spending praying and fasting as a church family, as a faith family, as a church community. I don't know about you, but these past 14 days have been really insightful for me as I've been saying no to my flesh and saying yes to the Spirit. Just been more uh, contemplative, more intentional with my devotion time and praying and seeking out God's voice in my life, drowning out all the other voices, all the roar of this world, and zoning in and focusing in on Jesus and his voice through his word. Thank you so much for those that have made the devo- that wrote the devotionals. Those things have been phenomenal. We have another seven to go, and next week we'll be kind of culminating our 21 days of prayer and fasting with what Lars mentioned, just a great time to give back to the uh, community to give back to those that are in need with our one meal um, I think we're doing next week and also a celebration because we can't help but party always love partying this is a party church because Jesus is abundant life amen he said hey I've come to give you life and life more abundant so we always want to have abundant life here so next week is going to be a party so don't miss out okay here we go Acts 21 we're going to have to kind of set the scene a little bit. Let me just warn you this morning, lots of scripture, like a lot of scripture, okay? But we're going to be all right because you guys are Bible students. you got your Bible open in front of you. It's going to be a great time. Here we go, Acts 21. We're going to pick it up in verse 27. Acts 21, pick it up in verse 27. Here we go. I'm reading out of the ESV version. Now, when the seven days were... Now, you got to remember, you guys were here last week. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, him being Paul, they stirred up the whole crowd and they laid hands on him and they cried out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Uh, Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. That all the city was stirred up, say stirred up. And the people ran together. They seized Paul. They dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. Now, as they were seeking to kill him, it's like the, how many times has Paul been, you know, people seeking to kill him? As they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune, which is like the Roman commander of over a thousand soldiers, of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So he at once, he he took some soldiers and some centurions, and he ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune, the people, right, the soldiers, they they stopped beating Paul. And the, the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Basically, from this point on, Paul will always be in chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done, and some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another, and he could not learn the fact because of the uproar, so he ordered him to be brought to the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried straight up crowd surf by the soldiers because the violence of the crowd, for the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. 
This is our text for us this morning. Would you join me as we continue to pray? Ask God to bless our time here. Father, I am so aware, so in tune with the fact that what you have to say to us is of greater importance than what we have to say to you. So here we are this morning, our ears attentive to your voice, your voice here, not Nate Wagner's voice, not Nate Wagner's alliterations, but your voice, your words spoken in here today. We're listening. We're listening to you. We're listening to your spirit. What are you speaking? What are you stirring up? What do you want us to change? What do you want us to do? How are you encouraging? How are you directing Who needs hope? Who needs peace? Who needs joy? Would you extend it and would you grant it today? We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Knock, knock. We're going to be talking about opportunity today. Opportunity. Opportunity knocks just once in a lifetime. So they say. You might remember Tom Brady. Anybody ever heard of Tom Brady before? All right. Now, again, you guys know I'm not that athletic but I do like watching sports every once in a while, and I can Google research things like this. Tom Brady, right, is a quarterback, and, of course, he's one of the best ones ever in the entire world besides, I don't know, Joe Montana. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. So Tom Brady, before he was the Tom Brady that we know of, he was just, like, you know, sitting on the bench uh, because the quarterback at the time was a guy named Drew Bledstone or Bloodshoe or something like that, right? And uh, it's week two in 2000, I think it's 2001, 2000, and the quarterback gets injured. Drew gets injured, and he's sitting out on the side. And all of a sudden, Tom Brady comes in. He's number two on the bench. And all of a sudden, opportunity began to knock for Tom Brady. And he steps into that moment because the quarterback is injured, and basically the rest decades, two decades later, the guy is who he is today. But what if Tom Brady had not been prepared for the opportunity knocking? What if he had not been practicing and studying tape and training and learning and progressing? What if he had just said, I'm a bench warmer, homeboy Drew's never going to get injured, I'm never going to play, forget about it. No, no, that was not his attitude. He knew that someday opportunity is going to come a-knocking, and I want to step into that. That's what we have for us this morning. What we're going to see is Paul has an opportunity to step into What we're going to see is a couple points this morning. We're going to see that opportunity needs to be expected. We need to expect opportunities. Secondly, we need to understand that opportunities can expire. Thirdly, kind of a little bonus, we're going to look, we're going to learn, we're going to kind of see the opportunity explain, like what is the opportunity for Paul? And then we'll close with this idea of opportunities expanded, expanded. All right, yeah, I got four points today, okay? You can handle that. You can be all right. They're not going to all be equally distributed, all right? So just don't worry about it. So the first one, let's just set the scene for a moment because we're jumping back in. We've got to kind of remind, kind of get our minds freshened up again. You might remember from last week that Paul was in a scene that began with humility and love. Humility and love. We remember last week that the Christian Jews in Jerusalem, Paul had ended his third missionary journey. He's back in Jerusalem, back at the mega church in Jerusalem. James, the senior pastor there. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the senior pastor there. And there's some Christian Jews that have some bad blood with Paul. They had some beef with Paul. And they thought Paul had been preaching against the Moses Mosaic law and against ceremonies and against, rit- against rituals. They thought that Paul was really kind of like turning his back on his Jewish heritage. And they had this bad blood, this beef against Paul. And you might remember that the senior pastor James suggests to Paul, listen, what I think you should do is you should, you should step into this opportunity. There's, there's four men that are taking this vow, this Nazarite vow for 30 days. And I suggest, Paul, you join them on this vow. Yes, I know that vows, just like our, our prayer and fasting, it doesn't earn salvation. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, God's not smiling even bigger on us. Like we're not earning our way to salvation. This vow is not going to grant greater access to God. But Paul, it'll show you that you have solidarity with the Jewish people, that you're with them. You're not against them. And so Paul, right, he could have been an attorney and he could have been a architect. He could have built a case or he could have built a bridge. And he builds a bridge and he joins in on this vow. And he goes in the last seven days. And so he's taken this vow. He's maybe shaved his head. He's decided not to eat anything made out of grapes or no no wine. He hasn't defiled himself with with any unclean thing. So now we are, verse 27, we're seven days in this, this last little moment, and Paul is in the temple, kind of fulfilling his day, the last day of the vow. 
in the crowd, notice, notice the, um, what happens is, uh, let's, let's look at the, what began as humility and love turns to hostility and lies. And what we see is that the crowd kind of, kind of gets crazy and they see Paul and they presume, they assume that he brought a Greek into the temple with him. Now, just as a little bit of context, the temple at that time, the temple mound was almost 40 acres. It's the place where they had church, like their church property, 40 acres. We got three acres here, so a lot more than this. And they had kind of on the temple, there were some different areas. There was the inner court. There was the court of the women that only Jewish women could go to. And then the largest court, the outer court, was called the court of the Gentiles, where anybody could go into and what the Jewish crowd thought that Paul had done is taken his Greek friend, his Gentile friend, and brought him all the way past the court of Gentiles, past the court of women, and into the inner sanctuary. Now, Paul had not done that, but they had just assumed that. And so there, there's, like this, there's like this confusion. There's this chaos. There's this riot. Okay? Now, check it out. Look at verse 30. We read this chaos because of what they thought Paul did. All the city is stirred up. The people run together. They seize Paul. They drag him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. They were seeking to kill him. And, they, and the word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in. Confusion. The crowd's in confusion. There's chaos. The crowd is, is getting riled up. And in this big kind of, this kind of court where, where Paul was kind of in church. So you can just imagine like this huge kind of open area. Right next to the temple in this day was something called the Antonia Fortress where thousands of Roman soldiers were always kind of stationed, ready to go if anything happens. Well, one sees, looks out the window and sees this kind of chaotic scene down in the temple floor, and they dispatch some soldiers to go and figure out what is happening. And we find that they can't figure it out. We read it earlier, like there's so much chaos, so much confusion. What's going on? They felt the simplest thing to do was it felt like this entire crowd is against this one guy. So let's get this one guy out of here. And we read that they put Paul in chains. Most likely, just kind of, you can imagine, kind of handcuffs, if you will. And they begin to take him out. But the crowd is so chaotic. They're so mad at Paul. They're so fired up of what they thought he had done by kind of defaming their temple and just all the kind of emotions of that moment. As they begin to try to take Paul out, but they can't. The crowd's pressing in. Like, just imagine, like, when, you let, when you've ever gone, like, before COVID, like, went to, like, a baseball game, like, in a big stadium or a football game, and you're, the game is over and everyone's leaving. Just imagine, like, all the people trying to funnel out, and they're trying to get Paul. And so finally, the soldiers, like, pick up Paul over their heads, and they're carrying him out of this temple ground area, taking him away. Crazy scene. Now, the reason I want, you to, I want you to kind of paint this picture is because what's going to happen next? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but like what would be running through my mind is soldiers, like, lift me higher. Like, soldiers, can you walk faster? Soldiers, let's get up those steps. Let, get me out of here because this crowd is, is in, in sense, it's inflamed, and they're seeking to kill me. So please get me out here as fast as I can. But notice the calmness of Paul here. Right? We've described this scene. There's just so much antagonism against him. There's just so much hatred. They're almost like foaming out the mouth, at the mouth, trying to kill him. And notice what happens. Verse 40 of Acts chapter 21. What happens is Paul says, wait a second, wait a second. Don't take me away just yet. Can I, can I speak to the people? Verse 40 says, and when the Roman guy had given him permission, Paul Standing on the steps. So he must still be in chains. He motions with his hands to the people. How does he do that with chains? I don't know. And then there was a great hush. And then he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying. I mean, can, can you kind of picture the scene? The chaos, the confusion. And all of a sudden, the opposite of that is Paul's calmness. Just moments before, they're pressing in to kill him, and now he, then he's crowd surfed out, and now he's standing on these steps. You can kind of picture these steps overlooking this huge area, this 40-acre land where everyone's at, this mob. And he says to the Roman centurion, this, this guard, this official, hey, I want to address the people. I want to address the people. Opportunity, number one, needs to be expected. Uh, expected. What can we learn from Paul's calmness? You see, he was on the lookout for an opportunity to preach the gospel. He was 
always expecting a moment to step into. Opportunity, he was expecting it. He was paying attention. Right? When you expect something to happen, you, you're kind of on the lookout for it. Right? You're kind of kind of more alert. Like possibly if maybe you're, you're in a dating relationship right now and you've been dating for a while and you're thinking to yourself, maybe he's going to pop the question sometime. You begin to expect it. And all of a sudden, what? You're just always on the lookout for it. Oh, a beach walk. Huh. So strange. Sure, I'll go on a beach walk with you. No problem. Whoa, rose petals on the ground. What could be happening right now? Oh, we come to a little basket in a little wooden charcuterie area situation. Wow. You know, all of a sudden, you're just like, you're just, you're, you know, you're expecting. This is the thing about Paul, opportunity. He was expecting opportunity. He was on the lookout for it. He was aware of it. He was alert for it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. He was stewarding his circumstances, right? He was stewarding his circumstances. He was not going to allow his circumstances to steer him. No, instead, he would steward them. He was in control. He was like, okay, this is an opportunity that I'm expecting to step into, and I'm going to make the most of every, every opportunity to preach God's word. He saw this as a move toward his calling. In fact, if you want to look at chapter 22, verse 14 in Acts 22, verse 14, we kind of read more of what God had called him to do. Paul, we'll get there in just a few moments, says this, verse 14, and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, which is Jesus, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. So Paul knew what he was called to do. I'm called to be a witness. I'm called to proclaim the name of Jesus. So I'm going to expect that kind of opportunity to open up. So even in the midst of a circumstance that was chaotic and confusion and life-threatening to him, he was able to stay calm. He was able to say, okay, okay, I'm, I could just let these guys take me away to safety, to the barracks, and, you know, that, that's next week what happens next or two weeks from now. Or I can say, wait, 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 no, no, no. This is a time for me. This opportunity is knocking. I'm actually expecting this. I'm ready to take a stand. Put me down, set me on the steps, and give me a chance to speak to the people. I, I just wonder, 2022, what has God called you to do? Well, whatever that may be, expect opportunities to open up. Maybe something God's put upon your heart is to be a better husband, a better father, whatever that might look like for you. Well, then expect opportunities to open up and step into those. Maybe you have been called. Maybe 2022 you've been praying and fasting and just seeking the Lord. Maybe there's some conversations that you need to have. Maybe with some certain people, maybe some family members, some siblings, some roommates, some housemates. So, so okay. Now expect that opportunity to open up and step into. And maybe you've been challenged this year to get connected in community. Well, then expect that opportunity to open up so you can step into. What's it look like? After church, go to that big thing that says start here. That's how you get connected, right there. It's not that hard. Go right there. Go right there. Opportunity, expect it right there. I just wonder, I wonder, what does 2022 look like for you? What does God want to do? What opportunities do you need to expect, be alert, be awake, be aware of to step into? Because here's the second point. The truth of the matter is opportunities expire. They expire. Your season of life that you're in right now will not always be that way. I remember I have four kids, and I, and I have a 14-year-old now. So finally, after 14 years, I'm reaping the rewards of having a daughter first, and she's babysitting for free, for free. Because I, eat her, she, she, I feed her, right? She has a roof over her head, so she can at least watch her brothers every once in a while. But I remember being like you. Think about the poor dolls and the cleans. I think about you guys. Your oldest is not quite old enough. And so you've got to basically just coordinate, just move heaven and earth to go on a date night. Which is why if you guys missed, we had, a, we had date night last night for you guys. Who was there last night dropping the kids off? Yes, youth, little youth fundraiser. We had about 60 kids here last night. And the parents were just basically kicking them out the door. And they were running out of there. It was awesome. But I remember, 
that sees in life, you're not going to always be looking for a babysitter. Not always going to, what, Westmont student, can I invite over to my house right now to watch my babies? Right? It's not going to always happen. Opportunities expire. Potential is perishable. It's not going to always be like that. You're not going to always have housemates. You won't always have roommates. You won't always be single. You won't always have that job. You won't always be struggling to figure this thing out. Opportunities expire. Just think about this. Bring your mind back to Esther. You know Esther in the Bible. She's chosen to be the next queen of Persia. And she's a Jew. And her uncle Mordecai finds out there's a plan by a man named Haman that wants to kill all the Jews of the land. And Mordecai says to Esther, 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 you got to do something. You're the new queen. You can make a stand. You could do something. And Esther's kind of like, I'm not sure what should I do. And Mordecai says this. Some of you Bible students are aware of this. Esther 4 and verse 14. Mordecai says this to Esther. She says, Esther, if you keep silent at this time, like if you don't, if you miss this opportunity, you're not going to step into it. If you keep silent, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. In other words, if you don't step into this, someone is going to. But for you, it's going to expire. If you, don't, if you keep silent, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your household's father, your father's household will perish. And who knows, you guys know this, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. He was saying, Esther, Esther, this is an opportunity. It's knocking. But if you don't take it, it's going to expire. It's going to expire. This moment's going to pass you by now. I don't need a show of hands to, to, to know because I know myself how many of us have watched opportunities expire. How many of us have stepped away from a situation only a few minutes later to think, oh, man, I should have. I, I, I wish I would have, but it was a little bit too late. What we can learn from Paul's calmness in this chaotic moment is opportunities there to be expected. Are you alert? Are you awake? Are you aware to see them? Because opportunities will expire. That could have passed him by. And he, Paul knew he had this opportunity to speak to thousands of people at that exact moment. What opportunities do you have? It's not too late. Well, let's think about more specifically, what was the opportunity at this moment for Paul? Let's look at the opportunity explained. Chapter 22, verse 1. So Paul now has the stage. He's going to do something pretty powerful. Look at verse 1, Acts 22. Paul says, brothers and fathers, which is an interesting way to say it, the people that just wanted to kill him. <laughs> brothers and fathers, how sweet he is, how forgiving. I mean, I can't believe it. Brothers and fathers. Hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. So all of a sudden, this crowd, this mob just becomes, it just hushes. And Paul has a chance now. He's going to do what? He's going to share his story. He's going to share his story. The word there for verse 1 for defense is this word apologia where we get the word apologetics from, the idea of defending the faith, giving a defense for why you believe Jesus is who he says he is. And so Paul's going to now share his story of how God changed his life, how he encountered Jesus, that Jesus set him free from sin and shame and guilt and gave him purpose and peace and hope and joy. This is one of the four times Paul will share his testimony. And you might think, well, if I had a testimony like Paul, I'd be sharing it all the time too. But let me just remind you, let me just encourage you, your story is powerful. Share your story. How God has changed you. What God has done in your life and how now you're living for Christ. Your story is powerful, not for its entertainment value. Like, you don't, maybe you don't have some crazy thing. Like, I used to be in prison and I, you know, did stuff and now I don't do that stuff. You know, no, no. Your story, your story is powerful because it's your story. It's how God's moving in your life. So how often do you share your story? I don't know, but share it more. Paul does it four or five times in the Gospels. We are all through Scripture. We see him over and over again. And here it is again. The truth, the power of your story is not in its entertaining value, but in the truth of what God has done for you. Who you were before Christ, how you encounter Christ, and how you're living for Christ. So a few things I wanted just to notice in this sharing of the story of Paul for us. 
First, he talks about his conduct before Christ. Look at verse 3. So Paul's speaking. He's op- making an opportunity here. Okay, here's some, a lot of scripture here. Let's just get ready for this. He says, I am a Jew. I was born in Tarsus and... Um, Tarsus of Sicily, no, not Sicily, whatever that is, but brought up in this city. I was educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. I was zealous for God, as all of you are this day. Verse 4. But I persecuted this way to the death. Speaking of Christians, they were known as those that followed the way, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I persecuted this way to the death. I was binding and delivering to prison both men and women. Right, so Paul would come into this scene. See these Christians here. He'd take men and women away to prison. Verse 5. And as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness, from them I received these letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who also were there and to bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. So Paul begins, so we should begin with our story. What was his conduct before Christ? What was your life before meeting Jesus? And for Paul, it was pretty gnarly. Pretty gnarly story. He said he was zealous for God. He had this righteousness he thought before God, but he didn't reek, and he, and he kind of kind of um, played it out by persecuting the church, the Christians of that day. He would bind them in prison, men and women. We, we know that he was, um, he'd stand by at, at Stephen's death. I mean, it was a gnarly moment. But then something happens. Second part of the story is not only his conduct before Christ, but his conversion with Christ. Verse 6 says this, So I was on my way, and I drew near to, to Damascus. Now about noon, a great light from heaven shone suddenly around me. And I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. This got real. Now, there were those who were with me. They saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? The Lord said to me, listen, rise and go to Damascus. And there you're going to be told all that's appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. So he was on his way, minding his own business. And Jesus shows up and changes him, changes him radically. It's in this moment that Paul recognizes that he was wrong. He thought that he was doing something for God when he realized I'm doing something against God. And Jesus says to Paul, Paul, you're persecuting me, Messiah, Christ, the anointed one. You're persecuting me. It was at that moment that everything brought, was brought into clarity. As Jeremiah the prophet would say, he recognized that his heart was deceitful and desperately wicked. He began to understand that the way that he had been living, the things that he thought were important and of value that satisfied, they, they, they don't. Isn't that true of you too here, follower of Jesus? There was a moment in your life when you encountered Jesus Christ. And he began to change you, convert you. You became to recognize, wow, I realize that my life on my own leads to death. It doesn't satisfy. And you recognize what Jesus has done for you. He's taken away. He stood in your spot. He stands in your shoes so you can stand in his shoes. You can become righteous, the righteousness of God. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have real joy and real peace, real purpose. That's your story. That's my story. So Paul is recounting this. He's sharing this. And notice that he's real. He's real. See, being real about your past makes your story honest. It's been told that people are kind of like icebergs. You know, we we only like to show what's above the waterline. But here Paul, as he's sharing his story, if you think about it, he's lowering the waterline a little bit. He's being honest. He's being real. Hey, this is what I did. I, I, I stood by and I, and I put women in prison. And you guys know what I did with Stephen. I stood by while he was martyred. He's being real and he's being clear. He's being clear of what Jesus did for him. And that gives your story hope. So be real. Be clear, just like Paul here. And then thirdly, this kind of last moment in his story, he talks about how he's now commissioned. He now has a mission by Christ. Verse 12, 
And there's one named Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. He came to me, standing by me. He said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that hour, I received my sight. I saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you, we read this earlier, to know his will, to see the righteous one, to hear a voice from his mouth. And you will be a witness from him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And Paul is now commissioned. He recognizes now, now my, I'm going to be living for Christ. I'm going to be an example. I'm going to be a witness for him to everyone that I see and come in contact with. And what's kind of cool is that we see that Paul gets baptized here. I love that baptism is an outward display of an inward decision. In fact, as a church, we love to do baptism services. And in fact, if that's something upon your heart, you've never been baptized, you never made that public display of your faith, we'd love to have that opportunity for you. If that's you here today, why don't you go to the Connect Tent after church, let them know, hey, put me on a list to be baptized. I would love to be baptized. Right there, Marcia Libre, there you go. It's saying I'm all in for Jesus. And so, Paul says, shares his story. Now, you would think, okay, Paul, what a great moment, man. You've stepped into it. Opportunity's knocking. You stopped the chaos. You, you were calm. You, you expected the opportunity. Man, you didn't let it expire. Man, you've explained it. You shared your story. This is incredible. Your conduct before Christ, your conversion by Christ, your commission with Christ. All right, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to get saved. Awesome. No. Verse 21. He concludes by saying this in verse 21. And God said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Verse 22. Now, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from this earth. He does not, he should not be allowed to live. Our final point this morning, opportunity expanded. Paul shares his story, powerful emotional maybe there's even a, maybe a few tears maybe in the audience but he closes his story by saying that he has been called to go to what's it say in verse 21 to the gentiles and we read it, it said that word the word gentiles that the crowd erupts again and cries out away with this guy he's not worthy to even be alive right now what i want you to understand is in this this era Gentile hate was strong. The Jewish people, they, they, they did not like, Gentiles are basically anybody besides them. The Jewish nation, they thought, no, we are the people of God. And Paul, you're saying, you're saying that salvation, that Messiah is going to go to the Gentiles? Away with you. Get out of here. No way. That can never happen. In fact, you think about just their whole, you know, God always wanted them to share their story. From the very beginning, what's God tell Abraham? Abraham, I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing to others, to all the nations. From Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, God always said, listen, you're going to be, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. But they never got it. Think about Jonah, right? Jonah, he so disdained the Gentile people. That when God says, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh, a Gentile town. I want you to go there and preach salvation. Jonah's like, nope. Where's it go? The opposite direction. And while he's on the boat, all of a sudden a storm happens. And, and the sailors figure out it's Jonah's fault. And instead of Jonah, 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 Jonah could have said, okay, you know what? I know. Turn the boat around. Go to Nineveh. No, no, no. Jonah decides to basically kill himself. Throw me overboard. I do not want to go to Nineveh. Throw me overboard. I would rather drown than go to the Gentiles. And all of a sudden, a big fish swallows Jonah. Three days later, spits him up on the shores of Nineveh. Finally, Jonah's like, fine. Preaches the most, like this is seven-word sermon. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's all he does. That's all he says. And you can see him just mumbling it probably. And all of a sudden, Nineveh repents. And even in the end of Jonah, Jonah is so bitter. He's just like, I knew you were going to do that, God. I knew you were going to save those stinking people. I mean, in the story of Jonah, everyone is obedient to God except Jonah. The, the storm is obedient to God. The sailors are obedient to God. The fish is obedient to God. None of it is obedient except Jonah. Think about Jesus. Jesus is preaching a message out of Isaiah. 
everyone's like, Jesus, you, this is, you're, they're marveling at his teaching. And then all of a sudden he says, yeah, you know, and Elijah, he went to the Gentile widow. And, and the only leper that was clean, cleansed was Naaman, a Gentile. And they're so furious at Jesus saying that salvation and cleansing could go to Gentiles that they begin, you know what they do? They begin to push Jesus off a cliff. So much, they're like, no, 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 no. There's no opportunity for those guys. And, they, and then all of a sudden, Jesus, you know, because he's Jesus, he, can, he just disappeared and got away from them. But I just wonder. Opportunity expanded. Worship team can come on up right now. Opportunity expanded. I just wonder, have you drawn a circle around your life and said, okay, here's, here's the people that I'm going to pray for. Here's the people that I want God to bless. Here's the people that I, I, I want, you know, just a abundant life for. It's, and they're in this circle. It's my parents. It's my spouse. It's my family. It's my friends. It's maybe my coworkers. Maybe like a neighbor or two. And I just wonder, this year, does God maybe want to expand your circle out? For Paul, for Paul, love had no limits for Paul. For Paul, love had no boundaries. Love had no stopping points. He knew that once he said the word Gentiles, he knew that crowd was going to be just livid. But if he didn't say, I've come, to, I've come to preach salvation to the outcast, to the Gentiles, to those that you think don't deserve it, if he had not said that, then he wouldn't have been preaching a true gospel because Jesus came to save the whole world. Jesus came to break down the walls of separation. Jesus came to, to die for, for the rich, the poor, the Jew, the Gentile, the black, the white, the educated, the non-educated. He came for the whole world. John 14, verse 46 says this. I have come into the, John 12, 46. I have come into the world as light. So that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. I just wonder, do you really believe that? Are there people that are outside your circle that you think, you know what, I, I don't even want to pray for an opportunity to come knocking because I, I don't want to go there. Let me just be real for you. Who's a person outside of my little circle that I've been praying for expanded opportunity? Let me just tell you, it's not, uh, it's, 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 the homeless people, to be honest. I think about Rick and Mary Osgood over there and your heart for the homeless. Think about Tim Griggs, who now works for PATH, um, PATH organization that's reaching out, helping homeless become home, uh, have homes. To be totally honest, th that's, like in, that's like outside my circle. And I'm like, Lord, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, ooh, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for me. It's hard for me. But, Lord, I, I know God, okay, love has no limits. Okay, it has got no boundaries. Okay, Lord, how can this year, how can I allow my opportunity to expand? Are there people that I need to reach out to that I wouldn't normally reach out to? Are there people that I need to pray for that I wouldn't normally pray for? I just wonder, I just wonder. Maybe you're in your Christian life and you're just a little bit bored. Maybe it's because you've made your circle too small. And there's opportunities for you to step into, but you want to expand your circle. I challenge you, this year, this year, who would God want to, you know, have your circle, like, draw around, you know? For Paul, his mission was to the Gentiles, those that were not of the Jewish heritage. For you, maybe it could be that other neighbor. You guys know about my neighbors. I talk about them. Half of them are living right here, right out here. I got a couple neighbors. I don't want to put a circle around. Oh, Lord, could you expand that opportunity that I may step into? Do I really believe that the sovereign grace of God can save anyone at any time from anything? Do I really believe that there's no sin so grave that Jesus Christ can rescue out of? If I really believe that, then I should allow my opportunities to expand and open my eyes to be alert and aware and awake of all that God is doing. So would you take that challenge? These last seven days of our prayer and fasting, maybe that could be an aim for you. Would you expand opportunities for me, Lord? Would you expand my boundary of love? Would you allow me to love people how you love people? That whoever, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Would you stand with me this morning as we come to a close? We worship. We pray. We release. The prayer team is going to be over, kind of over to our, my side, my left, your right. They'd love to pray with you. 
Maybe today is the first time you've ever recognized your need of a Savior. Maybe today is the first time you've ever thought about Jesus coming to save you. I'd love to lead you in a prayer of salvation even right now. Maybe you're here today and you're a follower of Christ, but like I mentioned, maybe life is becoming boring to you. Nothing is exciting. Nothing is kind of getting you pumped up in the day. I wonder it's because you're not looking for the opportunity to be used by him today. We'd love to pray with you, love to encourage you. We're going to worship, we're going to pray, but let's just spend a moment, let me just pray for us right now. Uh, Father, as we're here in this moment, as every head is bowed and eye is closed, uh, Lord, I want to give an opportunity. Maybe there's some here today that do not know if they are saved or not, and today they can know for sure. And maybe you're here this morning in this holy moment, maybe for the first time want to place saving faith in Jesus Christ of what he's done upon the cross, dying for your sin, giving you peace, forgiveness, and hope. If that's you, I want you to just repeat this prayer after me. And the words help put, connect to what's going on in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I admit I'm more weak and sinful than I ever believed. But through you, I'm more loved and accepted than I ever dared to hope. Thank you for paying my debt, taking my punishment on the cross, and offering me forgiveness. Today I turn from my sin and receive you as my Savior. This is my new beginning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If that was you here this morning, we would love to get to know you more get to walk with you a little bit, get a Bible in your hand. If that was you here this morning, we'd love to get to know you. So if that was you, would you just stand out of the aisle, come forward, come meet me over here or the prayer team over there. We'd love to continue to walk with you in your life with Jesus. Let's worship. Prayer team is here. One more moment together.